Um, so today I'm going to talk about matrix completion mostly and by the end I might mention um, connections to free resolutions but that will mostly be um, in the second half of the talk. So I want to start with an example of a matrix completion. So suppose I give you a matrix. So I made this a non obvious example. So you take a 4x4 four four matrix that I want to be symmetric. So this is A, B, 1, and then A. Okay. Okay, so I give you this matrix and I think of A and B as variables and the task is find values for A and B such that the symmetric matrix is positive semi-definite. That is my question. So how any suggestions of how you might try to find these numbers A and B. I mean, this is a anything. What would you check if I gave you, I just give you this matrix? Any suggestion? So you can de compute the determinant. So let me just tell you what it is. It turns out to be very nice in this example. So this is the determinant of this matrix. So remember from Greg's talk, that is a very special polynomial in A. So this is a square and a minus. So that should tell you something about A. A should be 1, right? If you choose anything but 1, then this will always be a negative number. A minus 1 squared will then be strictly positive, and you've put a minus. So we certainly need, um, maybe I'll just do this by erasing, we certainly need to set A is equal to 1. <coughs> so that's sort of the principal minor <coughs> characterization of positive semi-definiteness. If the determinant is negative, then there must be some negative eigenvalue, because the determinant is the product of the eigenvalues. Okay, and B, you can do a similar trick um, if you look at this 3 by 3 block, and you will find that B must be equal to 0. So, and this will be a rank 2 um, PSD matrix, and because it's going to be uh, useful later, you can certify that this is a rank 2 matrix, um, PSD, by writing it what is called, I think, a Hermitian square. So you just write down a rank decomposition. So these are eigenvectors of this rank 2 matrix to non zero eigenvectors. Okay, so this will be a rank 2. Um, PSD completion of the original matrix that I gave you. So this is sort of the general flavor of the question that I'm going to discuss. But maybe let's sort of think about matrix completion in more general terms that I'm not going to focus on too much, but... So matrix completion is a very large um, area with lots of different flavors. Um, so let me just write down a very philosophical statement. So given some entries of a matrix or fix some entries of a matrix of some matrix it doesn't have to be uh, square even nor real nor I don't know so just any matrix M and then find the missing entries, those that I'm not given, and then there are very different constraints, so such that M has a certain property, and these properties might be very different. 
So for example, this could be low rank. So low rank completion of matrices is for example related to the Netflix problem. So if you have a huge matrix where every viewer rates the movies that he's seen, then you assume that these, um, that your preferences are governed by only a, a few sort of variables. Um, so you would think that the complete matrix of which movies which viewer likes is a low rank matrix. So can you complete a matrix to a low rank matrix, it has to do with compressed sensing. So that is a very common constraint. And low rank, it's very difficult to say exactly what low means and how you would compute uh, a low rank matrix. The constraint that we are mostly going to focus on today is you want the matrix to be positive semi-definite. For that, you need sort of, to make sense of this, the matrix needs to be symmetric. And it needs to have real entries. Otherwise, this constraint doesn't make any sense. Okay? So that's the constraint that we discussed in this example. This is what I'm going to talk about most of the time. Uh, and then you can mix these things, of course, for example. So we'll always also be interested um, in the second half, for sure, maybe today, in the existence of positive definite completions. So not low rank, but so you want full rank and positive semi-definite constraint. And I'll talk about a problem where you're interested in mixing these two. You want the positive semi-definite completion that has low rank. So I will talk about an application where that is the property that you want. But there are many um, completion problems, many flavors. So when I say matrix completion, I mean positive semi-definite matrix completion. Okay. Uh, okay. So let me talk about a problem that is called distance realization of graphs. that has to do with uh, finite metric spaces. So, let's first do an example. So suppose I give you a graph, finite simple graph, and I weight the edges. So I assign to every edge, maybe I need to number them. <coughs> then I assign to every edge a length. Um, so suppose I want square root 2, 1, square root 2, and this one I want to be 2 minus square root 2. And now my question is, can I put, can I find vectors and assign vectors to every vertex? So I want four vectors in some Euclidean space, such that the edge weight is the distance between, you know, so the Weight of edge 1, 2 is the distance between vector assigned to 1 and 2. So, so you want to realize the edge weights as pairwise distances of vectors in some Euclidean space. So question, can these edge weights realized as the pairwise distances <coughs> of vectors in some Rn. Um, okay. So that's the question. Um, so it's not too hard to see that in this case, if I have four, I mean, it's basically true, right? If I have four vertices, then if I can do it at all, I'll be able to do it in R4. 
because whatever four I choose, they span at most to null four, just restrict to their span. But this is slightly more technical. I want to make my life a bit easier for this talk and uh, make the additional assumption that these are unit vectors that I assign. So I want to realize them um, so Sn should be in n plus 1. So as the, on the n-dimensional sphere in n plus 1 dimensional space. It makes it slightly easier to write down what I'm going to write down. It's not a very restrictive assumption. So let's think about this. So in particular, if you give me four vectors, I will be able to fill this in. So if you give me four vectors and the edge lengths are pairwise dif distances, then I will also, there is no edge there, but I will also get a number assigned to this thing. Um, and it turns out that this specifies a four by four matrix that better be positive semi-definite. So let me translate this problem into positive semi-definite completion problem. So suppose we assign four vectors. Um, so if we can do it, we should be able to do it on uh, S3 to each vertex. And so I want to compute the pairwise distance. So maybe compute the Euclidean norm squared. Um, <coughs> so I'll just compute the inner product. And multiply out. So this is vi plus vj vj minus 2 vi vj. Or in other words, this is the norm of vi squared plus norm of vj squared minus 2 times the inner product of the 2. So I want to, so I've picked vectors on the unit sphere, so this is the same as 2 minus 2 times vi vj. So computing the pairwise distances with the restriction that I know the norms of these vectors, they are equal to 1. Um, computing the pairwise distance is the same as computing the pairwise inner products. Um, and these this may remind you of what is called the Gram matrix of this problem. You've seen it before. Um, so what I'm going to do, so given edge weights, okay. so write it down first. So these are column vectors, so I guess this should be. So I'm going to build the following matrix. So if I find them, V1 up to V4, I can just multiply this out. This is called the Gram matrix. So what I will see is um, So the first entry is the inner product of these, and then I will see the pairwise inner products of these vectors, and so on. So I will not write everything out, so, but you get this matrix, and you can compute these numbers in terms of the specified edge weights. So this is the weight, I don't know, I usually I think they're called rho ij. So this pairwise distance, I want this to be um, the weight of the edge between i and j. So I can solve for vi vj. Let 
let's see if I do this right. So this is one half of uh, plus minus two minus rho i j. Okay. So, I've done a lot of computations. So the upshot of this, given the edge weights, I will be able to fill in some entries of this matrix, but I won't know all of them. So if I don't know the edge weight, there is no way I'm going to know the corresponding entry of this matrix. So in this example, I will produce a 4x4 four four matrix. The entries of the diagonal, I'm going to write it down. So the entries of the diagonal are the norms of these vectors, which I assume to be 1. And then we know these four of diagonal entries. And there are two that we don't know. So this will be a 4x4 four four matrix. Um, what should I erase? Let's erase the 4x4 four four matrix. So in this example, what I would write down is 1, 1, 1, 1. And then let's see. So the 1, 2 entry will be, so the edge weight is square root 2, so this is 1 half 2 minus square root 2. Uh, that, that thing is squared as well, because it's... Sure. Yeah. You need to take the square root of this. No, 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 what I mean, you need to square the edge weight, so... Yes, there we go. So when you start with root 2, you will get 0. Yes. It's 1 squared. So this will be zero, okay? So this was complicated to say you put a zero there, okay? So the same is true for the one, three entry because the edge weight is the same. So one, three is this one. It looks non-symmetric. Yeah. <laughs> Symmetric. Okay, and uh, three, four will be, let's maybe do two, three first. Two, three is slightly ugly. Let me just see what, it's 1 over square root 2. This is not aligned properly. It's not the most beautiful 4x4 four four matrix. So these I won't know. I won't be able to fill in because I don't know the edge weight of 1, 4 and 2, 4. They are not edges. And this one will be 1 half. So this is a, the partial symmetric matrix that I get from this weighted graph. And this weighted graph will have a realization if and only if I can complete this to a positive semi-definite matrix. So I need to be able to fill in the question marks, which will give me the distances of 1, 4, and 2, 4. Did that make sense? Any questions? Okay, so let's maybe write down if one, if these vectors exist, if this assignment of vectors in the two sphere in R3 exists, then we can, so this exists if and only if Call this matrix M. M has a positive semi definite completion. <coughs> and the constraints is rank 3. So this number is the same as this number. Why is that? If this completion has rank 3, I will be able to factor this as a 4 by 3 times 3 by 4 matrix. And then you read the rows of, the, of, this, of a matrix in this factorization as as the vectors v1 up to v4. So the rank of the completion gives you the dimension of the realization. 
So in this example you might be interested in the smallest dimension of a Euclidean space in which you can put this finite metric space. And that corresponds to the smallest rank of a positive semi-definite completion of this partial matrix that you construct. So rank corresponds to ambient dimension. So that is sort of the motivation. And that, of course, works for general graphs. I mean, I just did it on this example. But if you have any weighted graph, you can still construct um, this partial matrix. So note the entries that you know of the partial matrix correspond to edges in the graph. And entries that you want to complete, the entries that you want to find, correspond to edges that are not in the graph. That's sort of the pattern of the partial matrix that you see. Okay, so this problem motivates the questions. So here you are explicitly interested in rank constraints. So for example, you can ask the question, So by the way that I constructed it, the rows of this A will be the vectors that you assign to each vertex. But this is a, a, real, a real matrix times its transpose. This is always a positive semi-definite matrix. Right? This is a sum of rank 1 matrices, if you multiply this out. So the rank 1 matrices are the inner products of the correct things, of the columns with the rows. So this is always PSD. It's also easy to see, right? If you multiply So your PSD if and only if all these products are non-negative, right? But this is the same as which one I find nicest. This is the same as ATV. So I mean, okay, this is the norm of ATV squared. This is the inner product of the vector with itself if you write it this way. So this is always going to be a positive semi-definite matrix. Okay. Questions you may ask. So given a weighted graph, maybe just ignore the weights. If you're just given the graph, you can ask, you might be interested in the smallest rank so, of a PSD completion. So just given the graph, what is the smallest number such that every such partial matrix that you build that has a completion has a completion of rank K. What is the smallest number k such that has a positive semi-definite completion. <coughs> so no matter, so what this number means is if you take, if you assign edge weights and it's realizable then sometimes you will have to go up to RK to realize this finite metric space. Sometimes you might be able to do better, but there is an assignment of edge weights such that you need RK. But you can put everything that you can actually put into a Euclidean space into RK. Right? So that's sort of the smallest case such that you can guarantee that all realizable finite metric spaces sit in this RK. That's this number. 
So that number is in general very difficult. Um, so this number was studied by Monique Laurent and uh, co-authors, and they call this the Gram dimension of the graph. This thing is called Gram dimension. was introduced by Monique Law. So note this is only an invariant, so that only depends on G and not uh, weights on G. So it's an invariant of the graph without its edge weights. So let me see, in this example, I will not make a claim, but I think it's three. Um, So maybe another question you might be interested in. So I might relate this to a sum of squares problem in time. Okay. Another question you can ask, which I will discuss today. So given the graph, how, how do you know if a matrix has a PSD completion? How, what is the set of completable matrices? turns out to be a convex cone. That have a positive semi-definite completion. And we will see that this depends very much on the graph. For some graphs, it's a, we will see a nice description. And for other graphs, it is very, very difficult to describe the set in a nice way. So to test whether the partial matrix that I'm giving you has a PSD completion is very difficult in general. OK. And then, of course, you may ask, which I'm not going to talk about at all, I think, so how can you actually find one? If I give you a partial matrix and I tell you it will have a PSD completion, how will you compute one? Um, there's also some work on this. OK. Any questions? Did that make sense? So I will spend. This convex cone can be related to the sum of scale? Yes. That's what I'm trying to. This is what I will focus on. Okay. This question for today. I will reinterpret this in terms of sums of squares. Mm -hmm. Which will still not necessarily give you a good way of testing membership or um, not necessary. Okay, so let's see. Let's maybe get back to the example of this graph. <coughs> One, two, three, four, five, um, so a G partial matrix, let's just write this out again, so is a matrix where I know the top right 3x3 three three block three, two, three. I always know the diagonal and then I also know this entry So this is what this graph will tell me, right? If, it, if I have a G partial matrix, I know 
always the diagonal, I know entry 1, 2, 2, 3, 1, 3, and 3, 4. And there are two missing. Okay. But a symmetric matrix is always also a quadratic form. So how do you translate this into a quadratic form? Well, you multiply with the vector of uh, variables. So symmetric matrix is the same as a quadratic form. How does that work? Well, M corresponds to X1, Xn, M times. So also a partial matrix will give me a quadratic form, but there are some monomials that don't have a specified coefficient. So if I translate this matrix into a quadratic form, I will know the coefficient of x1 squared, x2 squared, x3 squared, x4 squared, and then x1, x2, x1, x3, x2, x3, x3, x4. But I will not know the coefficient of x1, x4, and I will not know the coefficient of x. Did I draw this right? Yes, okay. x2, x4. Okay. <clears throat> but that's the same as saying I know so, not knowing some coefficients is the same as saying I know this quadratic form modulo some ideal, or modulo the linear space of quadratic forms that have any coefficient. So, <coughs> why is that? Well, let's just write down. So, having a 1 in this spot means corresponds to this quadratic form um, and not knowing the coefficient means I read the quadratic form modulo this monomial because then I can put anything there. So a G partial matrix for this G corresponds to a quadratic form modulo The span of the two things I don't know, 2, 4. So modulo these two monomials, I know the quadratic form. So, but this is, so, this is an element of a homogeneous coordinate ring, right? So this thing, oh, where do I put this? So this thing So for an algebraic geometer that is the same as an element of this homogeneous coordinate ring in degree 2. It's a quadratic form modulo these monomials. So this is the homogeneous coordinate ring. of the variety defined by these two. So this will be in uh, P3. Three, we have four homogeneous coordinates. And in this example, the variety is also very easy to write down. So if you want both of them to be zero, then x4 is equal to zero is one solution. That's a linear space. And the other way that this can be zero is if both x1 and x2 are equal to zero. And that's a line. So this is spanned by E3 in P3. 
So this is a subspace arrangement. It's a coordinate subspace arrangement. And that is what always happens. It's not specific to this example. But that's a slightly... Well, you have to think about this for a while. Or for a minute at least, maybe. <coughs> okay. So what is the set of completable matri matrices? And that is where we should remember Greg's talk. Um, so a positive semi-definite quadratic form is the same as a sum of squares of linear forms. But if I have a sum of squares of linear forms and I read it modulo and ideal, it's still a sum of squares. So having a positive semi-definite completion means I can modulo this ideal, write it as a positive semi-definite quadratic form. So there's a positive semi-definite quadratic form representing this element in the coordinate ring. And that is the sum of squares of linear forms in the ring, polynomial ring as a quadratic form. But that will still be a sum of squares modulo the ideal. So the cone of completable matrices is the same as the cone of sums of squares in this coordinate ring. So it's the cone of sums of squares on this thing, which I will call xg. This will always be a coordinate subspace arrangement that I will talk more about. So being having a positive semi-definite completion is the same as being a sum of squares modulo the square-free monomial ideal that I get from the graph. Okay. So it's particularly nice um, if sum of squares are equal to non-negative polynomials. That is sometimes true and sometimes not true. So what does it mean to be non-negative on Let's keep the subspace arrangement. So what does it mean for a quadratic form to be non-negative on this coordinate subspace arrangement? Do you have any opinions? So let's maybe just write this as A. So this is a partial matrix, right? I've written it in block form because I'm lazy. Um, so what does it mean for this partial mate or for this quadratic form to be non-negative on this subspace arrangement? Maybe I should be a little bit less lazy. Well, so if you plug in um, any vector from this plane, um, then I claim you're only looking at this log A. So this thing corresponds to A. Right? Because the x4 is always equal to 0. So you don't care about the last row and column of this matrix. So you only look at this block. And this block being PSD should remind you maybe of the minor characterization of being PSD. So it just takes out this block and says this needs to be positive semi-definite if I want the entire matrix to be positive semi-definite. Then this block that I've given you, that needs to be positive semi-definite. And the same is true for this 2 by 2 block. And this 2 by 2 block is the quadratic form evaluated on this line, when x1 is equal to 0 and x2 is equal to 0. You will only see this 2 by 2 block. And that also better be PSD because you've given me every entry of this block. 
Okay, so being non-negative, on xg corresponds to the principal minor characterization. of PSD matrices. So that is sort of the obvious necessary condition. If I give you a partial matrix, then everything that you already see, everything that is complete, needs to be positive semi-definite. That is what is called the obvious necessary condition. And so maybe the easiest question is, is this enough? Um, to check all of these completely specified symmetric submatrices? And the answer is sometimes it depends on the graph. So that is a theorem that many people proved, but I think it's now usually attributed to Grown, Donson, Saar, and Wolkowitz. So it says that the obvious necessary condition which is this one, right? It's the principal minor characterization This is sufficient to guarantee the existence of a positive semi-definite completion if and only if G is a chordal graph. Um, so what does it mean for a graph to be chordal? So again, so all of these answers that we like should be in terms of just of the pattern that you see. So this is to in terms only of the graph. Right? Your answer is the obvious necessary condition sufficient, so can you check the existence of a positive semi-definite completion just by looking at the fully specified submatrices? That is true, that is enough to do that, if and only if the graph is a chordal graph. So it only depends on the structure or of, on the pattern of the entries that you see. So let's define chordal. So a graph G is chordal if it has no induced cycles of length at least four. So for example, The graph that we've been looking at, this graph is a chordal graph. And the most typical, the easiest examples of non-chordal graphs are just cycles. So this is not chordal. This is a four cycle. Okay, and maybe just as a preview, let me tell you about another theorem that some of you may know. Chordal graphs also show up in combinatorial commutative algebra, so that is a result due to Fröberg. I think curiously these two theorems were proved in the same year, or published in the same year, or at least almost. Okay, so what does it say? So it says that hmm, so G is chordal and graph is chordal if and only if IG is too regular. So what does IG, what is this? So IG is the ideal generated by 
the quadratic monomials that come from non-edges of G. <coughs> so it's exactly the ideal we are looking at in this example. One, two, three, four. Then IG is generated by the two monomials that correspond to the two non-edges. So it's X1, X4, X2, X4. And if I call this H, then IH. So you need to label the vertices. Then this is generated by the two non-edges that I see, X1, X3, X2, X4. So this ideal will not be too regular because this is a non-chordal graph. But this ideal is too regular because this is a chordal graph. So, too regular, I'm not going to explain today, but probably on Thursday, just to be precise, I'm referring to the Castel-Nuovo Mumford regularity of this ideal. And the goal is on Thursday to uh, explain how these two theorems are related to each other. So both of them are equivalent to the graph being chordal, so the fact that this ideal is too regular is equivalent to the fact that the obvious necessary condition is sufficient, which you can translate into um, non-negative polynomials on this thing. Xg are equal to the sum of the squares on Xg. So this I will explain um, on Thursday. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.